Assalamu alaikum and welcome to Destination Next, a series of programs which will explore new and exciting places around the Greater Toronto area. I'm your host, Bilal Tahir, but I'm not the only one on this exciting journey. With me, I have my fellow explorers. And you are watching Destination Next. A new destination, what fascination. We'll go exploring a new creation. See to feel our travel around the world. See to feel our travel around the world. So here we go, a new destination. Some inspiration, a little agitation. We'll complication, we'll push our minds for some formulation. We'll go exploring a new destination. Destination next. In this show, us kids will travel on the GTA to learn about the environment that surrounds us. Exploring is promoting the Jamaat because in the Holy Quran, Allah had laid great emphasis on traveling. Say, travel in the earth and see how he originated the creation. Then will Allah provide the latter creation? Surely Allah has power over all things. Previously on Destination Next. Uh, we have over 450 different species of animals inside this aquarium, and we're going to be exploring three of the biggest ones, our jellyfish, our sharks, and our rays. Three species of the sharks inside the tank. We also have two green turtles, which you might be able to see. I've heard one of you guys say that they don't have bones, and that's true. These guys are made of cartilage, the same stuff that you have in your ears. What's that? So guys, we've made it to Planet Jellies. This is where we keep all our jellyfish in the aquarium. And today we're going to explore the Pacific sea nettles. So you want to follow me? Yeah. Let's go. These are our Pacific sea nettles. As you can see, they're very colorful, but that's not actually them, that's the lights. They're made of three different layers, one of you was wondering. And one of those layers is called the mesoglia. They're actually 99% water, the rest of them is uh, made of that same depth three layers I was talking about. And despite them having no eyes, they can actually tell the difference between light and dark. And that's so they know which way to swim in the water. They prefer to be in a certain level in the water so they can catch their prey. As you can see, these big long tails, that's their legs and they've got stingers that you know about. They do sting humans, but it's just a little pain. It'll go away. But for fish, it's, uh, they can get caught in those nettles. And that's what they use to feed. They're actually one of the few jellyfish that eats other jellyfish and their favorite food for green sea turtles and other turtles you find around the world. These Pacific, Pacific jellyfish, uh, you'll find them all on the west coast, up from Alaska all the way down to the bottom of California. Look, how do they eat? They eat, they just swim around. So I was saying they can find the day and the night, they can tell the difference between light and dark. So they face and they just drag their huge tentacles, which can get up to 15 feet in the wild. And they just drag and fish will swim into them. Some fish are immune to their stingers, though, and actually hide inside those bells because it protects them from other predators. Where's their stomach? Their stomach, so they have a very strange internal system. So you see right underneath the bell, right here, that little bit in the middle. So they'll drag the food all the way up, and they can actually dissolve it through their nettle arms. Whoa. That's creepy. Cool. Cool. That's cool. I wonder how they feel like. They feel almost like jelly, <laughs> exactly like jelly. And then I want to touch them. <laughs> Just don't touch their, their tentacles. <laughs> so the colors are changing. That's not actually them. That's just the lights behind. This color here is this is their original colors. So they're like reddish? They're a reddish brown color, yes. Why are their tentacles swimming in the ocean like without the... <laughs> Uh, because jellyfish, also in the wild, they, their tentacles, because they drag so long, they get caught in things like coral reefs or other fish will try to eat them. They get ripped off, but over time they can grow them back. What are like, the fuzzy stuff on them? So that's their stinging nettles. So they actually have, as soon as something touches it, they inject a small spike into their victim, and that creates like almost a toxin inside their skin or their scales of the animal. And that's what causes the pain. For small animals like small fish, that's very painful. For something big like us, it just stings a bit. It's not going to kill us. How big can they go up to? These guys can get up to about 15 to 20 feet, including their tentacles. 
which in this aquarium, it's almost the size of this tank. The tank is this thick, so it goes back behind it. And it's spinning around, there's a big pump that spins, so that's why they're going around like this. Why do they spin? Uh, otherwise, because they'll swim, and they'll probably all just swim into one side, and they'll just be stuck there, and you won't see them. <laughs> Whoa, that's a tango. That's what we call a jellyfish ball. We have to break them up. How do you break them up? We just use a, a stick, almost, like a broom. Do they lay eggs? They don't lay eggs. They have a two-stage uh, breeding process. They can do one way, which is called asexual, in which they basically clone themselves. So it's the same genetic material. And the other way is where they release polyps, which are tiny little jellyfish that attach to um, substrates and bits of rock and stuff. And then if another jellyfish does that at the same time, they can combine and create a new jellyfish. Whoa. So through cloning, they can actually live almost entirely forever with the same genetic material. Word of the day. So upcycling basically means to take a product and use it and then reuse it and reinvent it and give it a new purpose. Basically what I do to promote upcycling is I started this initiative with my mother called Flip It's Pouches. And we take milk bags and leftover fabrics and we put them together and upcycle these two items and make these pouches that do a really great job of reducing the plastic waste that goes into our environment. And they're a great replacement for Ziploc bags as well. Could you please show us a quick demonstration of that? Well, yeah, for sure. So basically, our milk bag lining is inside, and the outside is the fabric. And basically what you do is you can put really anything you want inside of it. You can put your lunches inside of it. You can use it as a pencil case or even as a makeup bag for when you get older. And um, basically, you just put whatever you want inside of it, put the little flap inside, and flip it inside out, and it becomes sealed. And then it's really easy to wipe down because it's plastic. So, you know, you can really use it for anything. Assalamualaikum Baji. What's your name? Uh, Wa alaikum salam. My name is Shumaila Bajwa. What are the projects that you have been doing to promote upcycling? So we have this cool, unique project where we use Canadian milk bags to weep sleeping mats for people in need. How long have you been doing this? And are you part of a bigger team? So we started in 2015, uh, Vaughn East Jamaat and Richmond Hill collaborated to do a weaving event. And we usually do these events and we open them up to the local community so anyone can come in and help us weave. Where do you donate your mats? So we used to donate them to the founder of this initiative, Angela, and she would send them to various missions across the world and it would help people in different countries such as South America and Africa. And now we're donating our mats to Humanity First where they use them for the shelter bus and give them to um, homeless people in Toronto. Could you please show us a quick demonstration of the mass weaving? Sure. So this is a small weaving frame we have. And we use these um, loops to basically weave the mats. And then this is the final product. How has this project grown locally? So we have been invited by the city of Woodbridge to do this uh, event at the Woodbridge Fall Fair. As well, we have been doing this project um, at the Vaughan City Hall Earth Hour celebrations for the past two years. Jazakallah Shamala Baji for joining us today. Jazakallah. So guys, we've come to our filtration system here at the aquarium. This whole filtration system only covers the dangerous lagoon, the big tank with all the sharks in it. At the top, we've called what, what's called a fractionator or a protein skimmer. This basically bubbles air through the water and it like picks up all the dirt and all the poop and it just flushes it out. At the bottom here, we have sand filters, which are compact with sand and you pump the water through and the sand catches all the waste. We also have something else called biobores, which add bacteria. And this bacteria is able to pull out all the harmful chemicals in the water. The bacteria love to eat the ammonia. And finally, we also have a chemical injector with ozone. And ozone is like oxygen, but there's an extra molecule inside it. 
and that basically helps add oxygen to the water and it also pulls out harmful pollutants on the inside. So if you have a home aquarium and you have a nice coral tank or a nice fish tank, you basically have this setup, but a very small version of it. This version here is big because we have a lot of water and we have a lot of waste that goes in from the animals. This is a visual representation of what it looks like. So this is the amount of salt we add, just on a larger scale. This is uh, what we use. This is the protein skin or the fractionator. So you see the bubbles coming up and that just bubbles over and it pulls all the dirt out and we can just rinse that away. And these are what we call bio balls. Bacteria live on this and that's able to pull out all the harmful ammonia and like, the waste that the animals produce. That's a, a heater. So some tanks are hotter than others, some are colder than others. So the piranhas are 26 degrees, dangerous 22 degrees Celsius. But then you have cold tanks of the jellyfish. They're only 13 degrees, so very cold. So this just acts as a heater or a chiller, just so you can control the temperature. Hey guys, guess where we are? Stingray! That's right, let's go explore stingrays. Hey, so we're here at Stingray Bay. Uh, we're going to explore our stingrays. We have four different species inside this tank, and they all come from the Atlantic Ocean. You'll see the guys at the bottom here, the big flat guys. These are our southern stingrays. You also see these guys here that are interested in looking at you and want to play. These are our cow nose rays. There's also another one, if you can find him, very spotted. We have three of those guys. They're called our spotted eagle ray. And there's also one other uh, ray who's hiding down there, and that's our rough tail ray. So some of the big flat stingrays, like our southern rays and our rough tail rays, they like to catch food that's hiding in the sand, like clams and uh, fish that bury themselves. So the stingrays actually bury themselves under the sand so they can ambush for prey, and also just so they can hide from other predators. Why are their tails, why are their tails so long? The tails are so long, it's almost like it can guide them in the water. They also have little barbs on the back of their tails that they use in defense. They rarely ever use these, but in the wild, if something tries to attack them, they can stick their barb into the animal and it should flee. It's got a toxin in it that uh, hurts the nerve system. I have a question. Yep. Yeah. You know how um, at the bottom, it looks like there's something opening like from its chin? And is the mouth here or here? Good question. Um, as you can see, they have some slits underneath their body and they also have holes on top of their head. That's called spiracles on the head and the bottom part is their gills. Uh, it means they can breathe if they're lying on the bottom and if they're swimming in the water. So they can breathe two different ways. And their mouth is actually underneath and you can see it. it's in between the two gills and it actually sticks out so they can sieve for clams and fish and things that are hiding in the, in the sand below. How come the stingers don't bother the other um, rays, so they're like all immune to it? Uh, good question. So their rays do have a toxin, but they are, because they they produce it themselves, they're actually immune to their own toxin, but it can still cause a wound that will hurt another ray. Is it painful? It hurts the nerves. In humans, um, it's not fatal, it's not going to kill you or anything. Uh, it's made from the same stuff that your fingernails are made from in your hair. It, so we actually trim these barbs and it doesn't hurt them because there's no nerve that travels through it and they actually regrow them just like your nails would. Um, but they do use it in defense and they can actually bend their tail. It's very agile and they can bend it almost up over the top of their body. So should we go see the stingrays up top and give them a pet? Yeah. yeah. So welcome to the top of Upper Ray Bay. This is our area where we can actually pet the stingrays. Uh, some of the stingrays like to come up, like the southerns, the cow nose. Uh, they like to, sometimes they like the touch because they can feel the electrical impulses through your fingers. And they're so used to humans that we give them food. In some places like the Cayman Islands, the wild stingrays actually come up to humans and you can hand feed them and you can pet them and get pictures with them. Our southern stingrays in here are actually fully grown. You can't see any at the moment, but they do get up to around six foot wide. And we do have an old girl, she's 25 years old, which is very old for a southern stingray. They usually only live to their uh, late teens. And our cow nose rays, we have a lot of cow nose rays in here. And they like to explore around in big groups in the wild, and they can get up to groups of thousands of cow noses all coming together at the same time. I have a question. Yeah? How come those ones are like separated and in that tiny pool? So this is what we call our corral. It's our stingray nursery. 
So the cow nose rays in the wild, they reproduce all the time. Once they have a pup, they can have another pup straight away and they're uh, pregnant again. So these guys are actually born in the aquarium. And uh, these guys are about three months to four months old at this point. So they're getting up there and they can be fully grown within the year. So these guys are actually our uh, bonnet head sharks. They're related to hammerhead sharks, but they're not the same species. Some sharks get very big, like you can see the great white. You can also see the, the basking shark uh, or the whale shark. Um, but these guys only get up to this size. They're fully grown. You can get, also get very, very tiny sharks as well. Wait, it, yeah. um, is there a, white, a great white shark? We don't have great whites. Great whites, uh, they like to explore and they have to be swimming all the time. So aquariums don't usually hold great whites. That was so interesting. Thank you, Anthony, for teaching us about these three different types of fish. You're welcome. Thank you for joining us today. Join us again on Destination Next. Goodbye. Next time on Destination Next. This space is filled with so many different objects. Objects that relate to faith and art and science. All of the calligraphy here, it almost looks as though there's a head on top of it. Well, I am the famous 10th century surgeon, Al Zarbi. 10th century? Jazakla for watching. We hope that you liked our episode today. You can also get creative and share with us your pictures and drawings for a chance to win Destination Next souvenir. Also, tell us where you'd like to explore next on Twitter and Instagram at MTA Canada. We look forward to hearing from you. That was so interesting. Thank you, Anthony, for teaching about sharks, jellyfish, and stingrays. You're welcome. <laughs> one more time. Three, two, one. <laughs> That was so interesting. Thank you, Anthony, for teaching us about. <laughs> can I just say? Can I say? Can I, can I just say those three different fish, types of fish? Yeah. Three, two, one, go. That was so interesting. Thank you, Anthony, for teaching us about those three different types of fish. You're welcome, guys. Thank you for joining us today. We're going to get on destination next. I'm going to pay attention, you have to do the, 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 the,